great to see everybody together and in person. Um, as we know, last year was a little bit of a difficult year. Typically, I'm standing up here with our executive director, Kate Doby, who you all know. Um, Kate is the person that puts these speeches together, has all the talking points and so forth. Kate and her husband, Eric, had a baby yesterday. <clears throat> so Kate will not be here tonight. Um, so you guys are stuck with me. I don't do talking points. If you guys want talking points, find me. I'll give you my email address. I'll send you all the talking points you want. Okay? So <clears throat> this being the 10th Hero's Journey, I don't say annual Hero's Journey because last year, obviously, we didn't have it. Last year was a, a uh, difficult year, but there's also some blessings that came. It was kind of a, a remarkable year. Um, and one thing I think it gave us is time to reflect and reflect on what's important. And a couple of things that come to mind are friendship, family, and freedom. We missed out on a lot of friendship last year. Sure, we could text, we could, we could email, we could FaceTime, but we didn't have this where we sat together, enjoyed a meal, we shook hands, we hugged. We missed out on that. We missed out on uh, family. We missed out on visits from grandparents, cousins, aunts, uncles, that sort of thing. Um, and all of that is because we lost some of our freedom. So I hope everybody sits here and understands that um, this is a great country, and we really enjoy our freedom. Uh, correct? <clears throat> now, there's a reason this is called Hero's Journey. We are here to honor and celebrate heroes. In my mind, that term is used way too often. If you had a baseball, you can dunk a basketball, you catch a touchdown, sorry, Jim Mora, does not make you a hero, okay? Heroes are those that stand in front of the line, sign up to protect our friends, our family, and our freedom. And that's why we're here tonight, is to honor those heroes. <clears throat> so we have two heroes that I want to uh, just acknowledge tonight. And one is Diego Carrion, who is a veteran of the United States Marine Corps. He's standing in the back. He's here with our family, with his family. They came all the way from Miami. <clears throat> they went through a family camp in 2019, so they're going to speak to you tonight a little bit about what our camps do and what they offer. Um, the second person is our keynote speaker, is Secretary of Defense and United States Marine General Mattis. <clears throat> General Mattis is kind enough to donate his time and drive all the way out here from Washington to spend the evening with us, so we really appreciate it and thank you for your service. So these are not the only two heroes that are in the room. We have plenty of heroes that are here tonight, and I want to make sure that we recognize them all. So I'd like to ask all the veterans to please stand up and stay standing. <clears throat> veterans, please stand up. Thank you for your service. You guys are heroes. I'd like to ask all active military, please stand up. Stay standing. Stay standing, veterans, stay standing. Active military, please stand up. Thank you for your service. You guys are heroes. I'd like to ask all supporters, spouses, family, please stand up. You guys are heroes. Thank you. Thank you all. Please look around this room, ladies and gentlemen. These are the true heroes of America. We're here tonight to support them and make sure they're taken care of. So thank you. <clears throat> we also have a tradition at Heroes Journey where we like to recognize a champion of higher ground. This is where the talking points come in. and I, I'm not going to talk talking points again. Ask me for an email. I'll give you her whole biography. But tonight we are honoring Penny Weiss, who's a fellow board member. Penny is over there. Penny, please stand up. So I'm just going to speak from the heart on Penny because I think the world of her. We all know that person when they walk in the room, when you get a text from them, a phone call, whatever it is, it makes your day better. It just automatically turns your day into a better day. That is Penny Weiss. If you know her, that is her. Penny is always the first one to house a veteran, house an intern. She's the one that makes stuff happen. Um, Penny volunteers her time. She's been with us for at least 10 years now, if not longer. 
Um, and she's the one who puts all of these events together, like tonight. Uh, she also supports a, uh, a local camp where we do a, um, a ranch rodeo, and she teaches them all how to ride, and at the end we do a rodeo. Um, and it is the most unbelievable, inspiring thing you've ever seen. So again, I've got plenty of talking points on Penny. Um, ask me for the email, I'll send it to you. But just so you know, Penny, you're a true champion, and we love you, and thank you for everything you do. So I'm not going to sit here and talk all night. You're not here for that. Enjoy your dinner in about 15 minutes. We're going to show the video and get on with the evening. So thank you. Thank you all for being here. Plenty to say. But if you can please give them all of your attention, they're going to lead us into tonight's paddle raise. Thank you. Well, first and foremost, I want to say thank you to each and every one of you for being here this evening. It is a, truly for me, it's an honor and a privilege to be in here. Uh, what I thought was nerve-wracking, or what made me, I guess, uh, nervous, it's back in 2001, January, when I stepped foot in Paris Island, South Carolina. And for those who are Marines, you know the yellow footprints. I thought that made me nervous, but no, in fact, it is indeed tonight being in front of all of you, it, and it's beautiful to see all of, all of you beautiful people, your smiles, your faces. I'm truly humbled by all your words, by your kindness, you know, to coming up to us, um, admiring my daughters, and, you know, and, and all that. It's, it's just words that I cannot express. And so I thank you for that this evening. Uh, with that being said, um, again, thank you so much. Uh, and, and on top of that, General Matt is in front of me, so it's like I almost wanted to stand in position of attention, right? <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it just kind of clicks back in the head, you know? But, um, but again, I'm, I'm, I'm very thankful, I'm honored, I'm privileged. Um, higher ground has a structure, you know? Kind of like the Marine Corps, the Armed Forces, they have a structure, and they provide tools to you that will help you survive, you know, whether you go to combat or whether you're in the military. This is what higher ground has. Higher ground has tools that has brought life back into me, that has allowed me to, to enjoy life after my service and after my injury. Because as, you, as most of you know, you know, when we come back, we're not the same, and it's unfortunate. A uh, little bit of my story, you know, I was, I was in, a, in a track, what we called an amphibious vehicle, back in 2003. And um, I, was, I was in there with seven other Marines. Uh, we got hit by about five, six RPGs, we got blown up, and only three of us came out of that, that, uh, that um, amphibious vehicle. I'm being one of them. So I'm blessed to be here. So that took a huge toll on me. And for the, for the longest, you know, I, I just, it, it was isolation, kind of like the videos that you see. Isolation, the PTSD, the, you know, the, the turning the family away. But, but again, you know, it's programs and, and organizations like this one who have the tools now that provided to me that I was able to take back home and say, you know what, there is life after that. I'm able to enjoy my life now. I'm able to be closer with my beautiful wife and enjoy her, you know, with my daughters and enjoy them. And, and that's something that, that Higher Ground provided to me and that I think nobody could take that away from anyone. Um, you know, they, they taught me something valuable that it took a while as well for me to, to try to understand. And it was that guilt, you know, that guilt of why me and why not my guys, you know, why I was the one. But... But between their tools and all the, the, the guidance and the meditations and the program and the activities, this is what I learned is, you know, it's not about forgetting those who went with me and that couldn't come back with me, but it's about cherishing them, their parents, their, you know, their, their wives, their husbands, and cherishing their, their lives and just remembering the happy moments. So I've learned to, to do that now, and I'm able to live a happier life because of higher ground. And so I thank all of you for being here this evening because your support means a lot and it has transformed my life. And I thank you for that. Sir, I thank you for being here. It's truly an honor and a pleasure to, to literally be standing right in front of you. So thank you. I'm going to turn over the microphone over to my beautiful daughter. Uh, she's going to share with you guys a little bit about her experience as well. So without further ado, here's Natalia Carrion. Hello, good evening. My name is Natalia Carrion, and 
It's an honor to be in front of all of you. So um, today I'm going to talk about my experience and how higher ground means a lot to me. So the moment that we got to the airport, Kirsten was there and she welcomed us with open arms that it felt like we were right home. So later then that day, we got to Pettit Lake, which was the family camp. And we met all the families and the rest of the staff members, and they were great. They attended us so good that there's no words to describe it. Um, uh, so yeah, and then um, <laughs> in the morning of the week that we had, um, we basically had our group separated. We had the parents with some staff members and then the kids with a different. And I was blessed to have Elena as my staff member there at the corner. And thanks to them, we had many activities planned. We would sometimes go hiking with the kids and play games. And as well, we would have like a theme for the day. And for me and my opinion, all those themes came down to one thing that high ground that I left high ground with was family being united. So getting closer to my family. Um, so yeah, and then um, <laughs> we. Uh, um, so I just um, wanted to say. So yeah. <laughs> Okay, so um, hello, good evening, everybody. My name is Isabella Carrion, and it is such an honor to be here. But before we start, let me say thank you to all of you on Higher Ground for making all of this happen, even through COVID. We still found a way to get it together and make this gala. So if we may, let's give a round of applause to Higher Ground. Okay, to be honest, higher ground has been the best thing that has ever happened in this family. Because when we left higher ground to go back home, my family changed, and now my family has grown closer in the past years. Also, some of the best memories that I have kept in my heart is that we made contact with other veterans and their families, and we got to enjoy the whole trip or experience with them. Also, throughout the whole week as a family, we got to try new things together. So what do I think of higher ground? I think higher ground means family. And that's the end. Thank you. Thank you all once again. God bless each and every one of you. Um, because again, because of your support, and your donations, you were able to transform lives the way that, you, that they transform my life and the, the, the water of my family. So thank you once again to every one of you. Have a wonderful night. Enjoy the rest of the evening. Good evening, everyone. If I could have your attention. Thank you, I know you're all uh, enjoying a remarkable evening, not least because it's for many of us, it's the first time we've seen you in person in three dimensions in quite a while. But I wanna add my and my wife Chris's thanks to all of you for supporting Higher Ground, for all we do to help these remarkable young men and women uh, on a journey to a more fulfilled life from whatever their injury may have been. So thank you all for that. I also want to special thanks to Elaine Wynn for allowing us to use her wonderful home. <laughs> Elaine, unfortunately, had something come up at the last minute, which you know, was, uh, prevented her from being here with us tonight. But she wanted me to make sure I said hello and welcome to all of you. So another round of applause for Elaine.
I'm Michael Boskin, or as I'm known at higher ground, Chris's husband. And I have the distinct honor this evening of introducing our special guest, my friend, General Jim Mattis. It would be hard, perhaps impossible, to think of somebody more fitting to speak at a dinner on, called Hero's Journey than Jim. He enlisted in the Marine Corps Reserves at age 18, and when he finished college, he became a first lieutenant. He commanded Marines at every level, from an infantry rifle platoon to an entire expeditionary force. It's, it would be hard to put in words what, how Jim is viewed in our military. When you write books, and you all have this wonderful book, which I commend to you, Call Sign Chaos on Your Table. But when books are written about you, then you've really arrived. And I want to just mention that when the Army uh, General Staff and the War College are doing reports on the Mattis way of war, you know that you've made a really important impact throughout our military. But Jim's impact is not just in our military, which I'll return to in a moment, but in our broader society. When he retired from the Marines in 2013, we had the good fortune of having him join us as a distinguished fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution. He edited a book, uh, uh, for example, called Warriors and Civilians, Americans' View of Our Military. There are a few things more important than sustaining Americans' appreciation and support of what our military does for us. As was said at the very beginning of the evening, it keeps us safe and free, enables us to have the luxury of enjoying our wonderful Sun Valley uh, and many other things. So Jim is a remarkable combination of a thinker and doer. He's a, a legend as a doer in the Marines. He, uh, as commander of CENTCOM, he commanded 200,000 American sailors, Marines, uh, Coast Guardsmen, um, soldiers, uh, etc., and allies uh, throughout the Middle East. And then, of course, uh, we lost him at Hoover for a while when he went to become America's 26th Secretary of Defense. We're delighted to have him back as a colleague, and I'm particularly privileged to hear from Jim and interchange with him almost weekly on a wide variety of subjects. Uh, he's a deep thinker, a student of history, a thinker as well as a doer, and a remarkable combination of both, something that our, dear, uh, our recently departed dear friend George Schultz described uh, as uh, combining ideas and experience was uh, the way to lead and Jim is a remarkable example of that. So I get to hear him on a variety of subjects, not just the status of our military, as important as that is, but things like the future of NATO, the threats to world peace. This Friday we'll be talking about Taiwan. Uh, I could go on and on, but amongst them are what we owe to future generations. And let's be clear, we owe a lot to future generations, and we owe a lot to our military for enabling us to owe a lot to future generations. So it's my distinct honor to introduce to you a friend, a colleague, a remarkable patriot, a remarkable American, General Jim Mattis. Thank you. Well, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael, and thank all of you for inviting me to be here with you uh, this evening. I'm delighted to be here in your little piece of heaven up here. If anyone ever doubted that America is a piece of heaven, just come to this valley, and you know the difference right away. <clears throat> I would say, too, that uh, higher ground is a quintessential American phenomenon. I've been all around the world and I had to leave America to understand how fortunate we are to have people like you so generous 
who look at your success as simply something to pass on to others, to include others, and to give give spirit uh, to others. It's very humbling to be invited. I didn't, didn't do anything special to be here. Uh, as many of the veterans here know, uh, now seriously, ladies and gentlemen, I get a lot of credit for what the uh, the privates, the corporals, the sergeants, the lieutenants, the majors, the captains, I get a lot of credit for what they did, and that, that's no false modesty. I would tell you that your devotion and commitment to these veterans who have paid the price, borne the, the uh, challenges to protect this great big experiment that you and I call America, this brings a very heartening sense. I cannot come here tonight without an attitude of gratitude, sitting here among you and watching what's going on. Uh, you have no idea how heartening that is for those of us who spent times on the fringes of the empire, not the geographic empire, the empire of the ideas about free men and women. Uh, how heartening it is to come back here to this piece of the Northwest, I'm Northwest bred and born, and to see this in action. I would, I would say too that we meet here in this majestic Bitterroot mountain range. And there's four ranges I know that come together. I think this is the Bitterroot right there behind me. Uh, and 200 miles, uh, well, it's close anyway. Um, but it's not only because it's the birthplace of, the higher, of higher ground. Uh, just 200 miles due north of where we sit this evening, there's a thing called the, a place called the Lolo Pass. And in the official Army campaign journal covering the Nez Pierce tragedy of 1877-78, there's a rather acid-tongued adjutant. But one of the things he wrote was not acid-tongued because even he was humbled to be in these hills. And he wrote that here where these mountains reach up to the sky, here we are reminded what he termed man's illimitable horizons. So higher ground, uh, this worthy cause that you all have contributed to this evening, it has its roots here in the Bitterroots, has its own inspiration of this essential American idea where the higher ground leadership and staff remind us, and by that I mean all of us, that we all have the same illimitable horizons, even the veterans who have given much. <clears throat> it's unique, I think, that it would grow out of the great Rocky Mountains. Here we're reminded that when America goes to war, we all go to war. Whether we like the war or not, that's not the point. We all go to war when we send our lads and lasses off to war. And here at the foot of Baldy lies the first destination ski resort in America, and one that going to war in World War II became a Navy Marine convalescence center, rehabilitating the combat wounded, the malaria-ridden troops in a manner that still draws all of us here tonight to the outdoors. We're so happy to be here for the same reasons that the Navy and the Marines sent their wounded here back years ago. These themes still combine and live on, strengthening us. The mountains reaching up to the sky and the Americans coming together like, like higher, uh, uh, excuse me, like higher ground and coming together to help each other to find better versions of themselves in the great outdoors of Idaho's Rocky Mountains. And that's where higher ground's vision comes into play. And it's also why I'm humbled to be here with you, having driven down here. It took me two days to get here, wandering through the mountains from my home, falling in love once more with this great corner of America. But thanks to those who donate time, resources, all of you and your own personal devotion in terms of coaching skills, Higher ground has achieved what is most needed in our country. All of us working together for the common good, focusing on what our veterans have, as we heard from the Marine family that was up here earlier, vice what they don't have or have lost in service to our country. The organization you have reminds me of a long ago Marine recruiting slogan, one with a strong nod to Confucius. It says, we build Marines in body, mind, and spirit. For that is surely what Higher Ground's family does and with its long haul strategy keeps alive in our veterans who you are replacing their loss with confidence and coaching other veterans groups with your strong brand of unleashing the full potential of veterans and their spouses, significant others, inspiring them again 
to reach for the illimitable horizons that they can really sense here at 6,000 foot in the high country. What you do is critical, especially now as recent wars dim in our fellow citizens' everyday lives. For the seen and unseen wounds of these wars are going to live on in our veterans, experience that even our most articulate uh, Supreme Court Justice, Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr., himself a combat veteran in our Civil War, called the incommunicable experiences of war. So while the current wars will understandably disappear from our nation's front page news, and time will heal many of our veterans' wounds, it will ultimately be a sense of hope, it will be a sense of coping, it'll be a sense of the power within, the friendships and the connections that will arm our veterans to feel whole again and integral to their communities, to feel the connection with family and neighbors, and thus waking each day imbued with a sense of hope. <clears throat> For combat can make good men and women better if the experience is approached from a position of wellness like higher ground does, vice a disease orientation. And I need to emphasize this, ladies and gentlemen, this fundamentally different approach that you have taken from the beginning. Higher ground stated perspective that you don't see veterans as broken individuals and your focus on veterans post-traumatic growth versus post-traumatic traumatic disorder is the most heartening and most enduring way out of the sense of alienation that strikes too many in our society today, including our combat vets coming home from the wars. It's also striking their spouses and significant others who also endured their own deployments filled with uncertainty here at home. We Americans have never believed that all the good ideas come from government. We Americans have never believed that members of our community in need were solely a government responsibility. Similarly, Admiral Jay Johnson didn't serve in the Navy for nearly four decades, and I certainly didn't serve in the Marines. Rather, he and I served in the U.S. Navy, <clears throat> the U.S. Marines, and our military belongs to us, the American people. And the American people historically have stuck together to help one another as higher ground does today. Today, our country faces challenges. <clears throat> Democracies go through these raucous periods, yet today it seems we can agree on less and less. We cannot seem to find common ground where we can work together. So higher ground as an organization has another defining characteristic in this time of national discontent, that of an organization that's leading by example to work for each other. Higher ground encourages us to work together, to recommit to our common purpose, to work toward a more perfect union by scorching each other with hot political rhetoric. And by restoring our veterans' confidence, you build on their example as well. You are part of their service. For they are the all-volunteer, selfless patriots who looked past hot political rhetoric and rallied to the flag when we needed them. And we did need them, ladies and gentlemen. Think back to 9-11 and the maniacs who thought by hurting us they could scare us. Those who murdered 3,000 innocent citizens of 91 countries on our land. A message had to be sent, sent to those who believed that we no longer raised young men and women who would volunteer to withstand danger and discomfort. Volunteers who indeed looked past the hot political rhetoric and signed a blank check to each of us here this evening, payable with their lives. Regardless of how these wars turn out, the message that we are not made of cotton candy, that we are not seaweed drifting in the current, had to be sent. As a World War II Marine, a member of the greatest generation put it, our country didn't need to be perfect to be worth fighting for, so fight we did. And as a commander of many of those troops, I never doubted that in close combat, with such murderers dressed in their false religious garb, the skill and the ferocity of our troops in the close fight meant that we would turn the tables on those who thought us weak. In many cases, we carried our buddies' lifeless bodies to helicopters, then turned back to the fight. Many of us veterans are here now because of what our comrades did on those tough days. And we'll never make sense, as you heard from the Marine carry-on, 
of why we survived in war seemingly random senseless episodes when our good friends did not. But we, the living, must carry on this hard work of building a more perfect union, of building strongly on the example of higher ground in taking care of one another, of finding ways to give back to others a sense of the gratitude we feel for living here in what is still the finest country on earth if we will make it so by virtue of listening and acting according to our better angels. Yes, building a democracy is hard work. It was designed by the Founding Fathers to be very hard work. And it requires a people imbued with a sense of service to one another. But it is noble work too, work that can draw us together and give us all a sense of purpose like what higher ground provides to all tonight. Your staff that's coaching benefit from this, the veterans do, and all of us who see your example benefit uniquely. For as a former president of Mexico once said to me, the only shortcut to happiness lies in helping others. I saw that exhibited this evening. Thank you. We should, always, we should always remember that we were born free by accident of birth in America, or like my mother, by immigration here and that we live free by the simple choice to live in America, and even as we see millions more who wish they could join us as Americans. So we are born free by accident, we live free by choice, yet we have an obligation and acute responsibility to pass on the same freedoms we enjoy to the next generation. For we hold this nation in usufruct, Yes, that's the word I said. I first discovered it in Thomas Jefferson's papers, and I never say it if I've had more than two glasses of wine. <laughs> he was an agrarian man. President Jefferson believed that if you owned the land, you could cut the trees, change the water course, plant crops, you could do as you wish, yet you had a responsibility to turn that land over to your daughter or son in as good a condition or better than you received it. Well, we hold this experiment we call America in usufruct, and we must turn it over in as good a condition or better than we inherited it, thanks to the blood, sweat, and tears of our predecessors. And while we haven't always had it right in America, thanks to those founding fathers, we have a near unique ability to get it right. Without simply pointing out where past gen Americans didn't have it right, it's for each generation of Americans holding our experiment in usufruct to continue the noble effort to make us right, to make us a little better on our never-ending journey to a more perfect union. In that quest, everything that brings us together tonight and as a people needs to be supported. And it's why I'm humbled and honored to salute you here this evening. For we must take care of these veterans because the younger generation is watching and they will inherit whatever attitude we de demonstrate when it comes to the nobility of service to our country and its values. Serving our country is noble, and it remains so, but that nobility must be displayed by all of us if that lesson is the one we wish to pass on. Tonight, we can see the storm clouds gathering overseas. We watch the authoritarian regimes acting as if the winds are with them. And here at home, we recognize we have an unhealthy partisanship. It's fragmenting some of our fellow citizens' belief in the value of America, a belief that I think can be restored by role models like you here in this room, because your actions, not words, your actions will influence others. Yours is truly the finest sort of civics education, leadership by example, leadership by your example. I've often learned most about America from foreigners, and I think back to a lunch one day with the Australian ambassador to Washington. I was the NATO Supreme Allied Commander at that point. And he commented to me that following World War II, the United States made the single most self-sacrificial pledge in world history. And I thought I knew something about American history. Uh, so I asked if he was referring to the Marshall Plan. No, no, he said. The Marshall Plan just showed what a unique victor the U.S. was whipping the fascists and then generously helping the German, Italian, and Japanese people back on their feet 
welcoming them back into the community of nations after a near merciless war. No, he went on, after World War II, you could have told devastated Europe that they were on their own with the Soviet Union, that twice we had been pulled into their wars and lost thousands, hundreds of thousands of our lads. We were turning to Asia, Latin America, and Africa for our markets and our future. You're on your own. Instead, he said, you pledged 100 million dead Americans in a nuclear war when you established NATO and said an attack on one is an attack on all. Isn't it ironic the only time NATO has gone to war is when America was attacked on 9-11? It took a foreigner to teach me that, ladies and gentlemen. And I stood a little straighter that day walking out of his ambassador's home. America had stood up for humanity, for the protection of democracy, not just at home. Years later, as our country's Secretary of Defense, those foreigner's words guided me daily. The greatest generation's example taught to me by a foreigner guided me. Another foreigner, this one an enemy, also taught me something about this great country. America has two fundamental powers. One is the power of inspiration. The other is the power of intimidation. Our military and CIA are the leading edge of our power of intimidation, and our veterans have stood tall in that regard. In an imperfect world, we need our military to keep our democracy safe from those who are threatened by it. But it took an enemy trying to kill me to remind me of our stronger source of power, America's power of inspiration. I'll take you back to the summer of 2004 in western Iraq. Since 1979, with the fall of the Shah in Iran and the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, I spent many summers in the Middle East, but the summer of 2004 was the hottest I've ever known. 126 degrees seemed to be the norm with 95% humidity. I was commanding the 1st Marine Division, 23,000 beautiful sailors and Marines, plus a bunch of soldiers and other SEALs and all in the heart of the Sunni Triangle, a place called Al Anbar. We were in a fight over an area the size of North Carolina, yet I had fewer troops to fight a growing insurgency than North Carolina has police officers. It was a tough time. We were outnumbered in many areas. Casualties were the daily norm. Of the 29 sailors and Marines in my personal command post, 17 would be killed or wounded around me in four months. And I was a general. I wasn't in the tough fighting. We were po I was pulling into a small outpost. It was out in western Euphrates River Valley, out in the middle of the desert, actually. You could see the river valley in the distance. And in, the sun came up, and here's 40 sailors and Marines living in holes underneath ponchos pulled over their heads. And the lieutenant came over and sat down in the dirt next to me, and he was briefing me about where he'd been fighting. This was a line of outposts, and their job was to stop the foreign fighters from getting in from Syria. If they got through the Marine outpost line along the border and they got into Baghdad, a lot of innocent Iraqis, a lot of U.S. troops were going to die. He was briefing me on where he'd fought, how many men he'd lost, how many enemy he'd taken out, and what his plans were for the next couple of days. He said, by the way, we caught a man putting a bomb on the road you were coming down last night. Well, that's kind of personal. Um, and he said, by the way, he lived over two years in London. He's an engineer. He speaks perfect English. Would you like to talk to him? I said, sure, bring him over. So after the lieutenant got done briefing me, he walks off, and pretty soon a Lance Corporal comes over with a guy with little plastic handcuffs on. He sits down in the dirt next to me, and I could tell he was Sunni, and I said, what are you doing this for? We're the Marines, you're the Sunnis. We're the only friends you've got in this frickin' country. Why are you trying to kill us? And he goes off on one of those rants. You know, oh, you Americans, you Jews, you're here to steal the oil. I said, no, actually I'm not. I pull my wallet out every time I pump gas in my car. But you're an educated man. If you're going to talk like that, I don't have time for you. So the Marine stepped forward to take him away, and, and the guy got a little nervous, and he looked at him and he said, can I sit here for a minute? I said, sure. So he's sitting there, and uh, he said, well, I don't like foreign troops in my country. Well, man to man, I can understand that. I wouldn't want them, and I wouldn't want them here and catch them. I don't want foreign troops here. And so we talked some more. I asked him about his family. They live over on the river about 10 kilometers away, wife and two daughters. <clears throat> We're talking some more, and he's, you know, he's got a cup of coffee there and everything, and he, he's settling down a little bit. He said, am I going to jail? I 
I said, oh yeah, you're going to Abu Ghraib. You're going to be wearing an orange jumpsuit for a good long time for this. You know, he wouldn't have, it hadn't been a good night for him. You know, he's out there with his wheelbarrow, his two artillery rounds, his car battery, and he looks up and there's five guys in camouflage utilities pointing automatic rifles at him. He knows his 401k is in jeopardy at that point, you know? <laughs> and so uh, I said, you're lucky you're not dead, but yeah, you're going to jail. And he said, I'm, I'm getting ready to go. I, I got to move on. I got to go see the next outpost and everything. So the Marines coming forward to get him. He says, can I ask you one last question, General? I said, of course. And he said, do you think, now listen to this, do you think if I'm a model prisoner, my family and I can immigrate to America someday? <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, you think about that. Here was a guy so filled with hatred, he was trying to kill us. But the power of inspiration of what America is, he would give anything to be sitting here tonight and his two daughters going to school out in town. So we need to remember that on the day when we're so dissatisfied with our country, when you think some of our fellow Americans have lost their head, remember that it is still the best country, the greatest country going. <clears throat> but the bottom line is it was a reminder of our power as a country to inspire. And I would just tell you that we still represent the flowering of the human spirit with this freedom that we have. We should never lose track of that just because we have it every day. And we're going to need our fighters too, and the thanks we owe them is so clearly felt in higher grounds leadership, not just doing the, your leadership by example and your staff as they focus on inspiring our vets, some of whom have paid a stiff price. That too is fundamental to our nation's unity. And here this evening, I want to note publicly that I owe a personal thank you to the veterans, every veteran in this room, uh, over their many years of service, from World War II, Jack, to Korea, to Vietnam, the Vietnam generation that raised me and taught me the grim skills that I would need, and certainly to the veterans of more recent wars. The example, the example, ladies and gentlemen, of veterans at Lexington and Concord, at Shiloh and Bella Wood, of Midway and Normandy, of Iwo Jima and Quezon, those examples remind today's young warriors that they'll never face anything tougher than those veterans overcame in their service. A quick case in point, in, in that during that period when I commanded 1st Marine Division in March of 2004, as some of you will remember, uh, I was ordered to assault the city of Fallujah. They had murdered some contractors and we were told to go in after the enemy. And so I went down, I had two assault battalions to go into the city. I went down to see them about midnight. And that's the time when generals step back. They get out of the way and turn it over to the infantry. They got their name, infant soldier, young soldier. And these are the 18, 19, 20 year olds under their 21 year old corporals and their 22 year old sergeants and lieutenants that's going to assault the city. As I was falling back with my couple of radio operators about a mile to get back to my vehicles, uh, and, and head back to my headquarters. <clears throat> I was confident that everything was in place. I was behind the assault company that would go in before dawn to clear out the enemy outpost so the battalion could go into the city. And the enemy caused some trouble there, it caused some mischief, and so I got down and checked in with the corporal, who was a squad leader, has 13 young sailors and Marines under him. And he said, no sweat, sir. He said, we'll take care of it. And after a few minutes, they did. And the enemy stopped being brave in that area again. And, the, uh, and so we're just laying there, making certain everything's calmed down. And the lads are stripped down to their combat gear. So they're very chilly laying on the desert floor. And they're just watching their watches as the minutes tick down to H hour for them. <clears throat> and they'll cross the line of departure. And... One of the young men who obviously was going into his first fight, the corporal was not, he'd been in the fight the year before too and been in many fights. He said, is, is Fallujah gonna be bad, corporal? And because we have ladies here, I'm gonna clean up the corporal's response a little. Uh, but he said, basically hush and get some rest. We took Iwo Jima, Fallujah won't be nothing. <clears throat> now you stop and think of that. That young corporal wasn't even a gleam in his granddaddy's eye when he took Iwo Jima. And somehow, coming down through the ages, coming down through the ranks, coming down through the history, 
young men feel a little more capable of what they're going to face. Why? Because those veterans, some of whom you're taking care of today, and their example also will resonate down to the younger ones. So do you veterans, wherever you served, whenever you served, wherever, whenever, thank you for standing the watch. Thank you for your example of putting our country first, for putting your lives on the line. And thank you, Higher Ground, for ensuring that those who need a hand getting their mojo back can find it with you. It's heartening, ladies and gentlemen, to be here with you. I'm humbled to be here. I'm up here thanks to the blood, sweat, and tears of a lot of young soldiers, sailors, airmen, Coast Guardsmen, now Guardians and Marines. I would just tell you thank you for including me in the most beautiful cathedral in the world in these mountains where you can certainly give thanks for our great good fortune of living in America and for our illimitable horizons. Godspeed to our troops. Thank you, and God bless America.